What an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I really, uh, uh, Rebecca, you've been awesome in helping to make all this happen and come together. So I wanna thank you first. Um, yeah, what a great day. You guys have this incredible museum. I've heard a lot about it. Uh, Gary Jobson, really famous sailor and uh, lecturer. I mean, when I told Gary I was speaking here, he said, wow, you've really shot to the top. So, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, applause to you all in your museum. Um, I know Rebecca had said this, but I'll just, uh, you know, just reiterate, um, how about uh, we'll, we'll hold any questions or interruptions till the end of the presentation, and then I promise I'm going to stick around and answer as many questions as you can come up with for as long as it takes. So tonight, I'm going to tell you a story about a motley crew of sailors who did anything and everything to get the job done. See that guy in red up there? That's me doing the scariest thing I've ever done in my life, having to free climb 50 feet up a rig in hurricane strength conditions to furl a sail. When I was 21 years old, I was hired to sail the American tall ship rose from Newport, Rhode Island to San Diego to make the movie Master and Commander. And that's our ship over Russell Crowe's shoulder. We sailed 6,000 miles in 36 days. We departed from Newport in January and sailed south to Puerto Rico. Terrible time of year to sail through the North Atlantic. We then transited from Puerto Rico through the Caribbean Sea to Panama. We transited the Panama Canal and then continued north along the western seaboard of North America until arriving in San Diego. This is a profile diagram of Rose. She was 180 feet length overall, 136 feet on deck. She has a 30-foot beam, a 15-foot draft, displaced 500 tons of water, and had 16 sails totaling 13,000 square feet of sail area, and the top of her mainmast was 130 feet above her waterline. So, what's it take to sail a ship like Rose? Well, for starters, it takes a lot of muscle. The original Rose sailed with a crew of over 200 men. We did it with a crew of 30. Now granted, we had modern amenities like alet engines and electricity and plumbing, but none of these amenities or perks to help us with trimming or setting the sails. We had to do it just like the crew did 200 years ago. And in order for us to pull that off, we needed great leadership. And that started with Captain Richard Bailey, who then hired our three officers, Tony, Andy, and Christina, who were followed by our engineer, our bosun, and our cook, and then finally, our lowly deckhands, of which I was one. So, how do I fit into this picture? I mean, I didn't grow up a sailor. I grew up in upstate Connecticut. And as you can see, I loved Popeye, but <laughs> that was about it for me with water. After high school, I took a path less traveled, and I enrolled in an apprenticeship at the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, Rhode Island, where I learned the fine art of restoring and building wooden yachts. I loved it. It was intense, but it was incredible. But when I wasn't building boats, I was out sailing them, which eventually led to me getting paid to fill in in the America's Cup 12 meter fleet in Newport. And when I knew I could get paid to go sailing, I found my calling. 2001 marked the 150th anniversary of the race that became known as the America's Cup. And to celebrate it, an event called the America's Cup Jubilee was planned in England. And I somehow landed a job on America's oldest 12 meter yacht, Onawa, who had long since fallen from grace when Earl McMillan formed a syndicate to restore her. We had one year to rebuild this boat. The nights were long, but we pulled it off and had her ready in time so we could ship her over to Europe so she could race in England, Italy, Monaco, and France. When I was 21 years old, I was living on this boat on the French Riviera. My life was awesome. <laughs> but like all good things, the job came to an end when the season was over. And I had to return back to America homeless, broke, and without a job. Newport Rhode Island, for those that haven't been, was made famous as a summer Gilded Age retreat. This is where Bob Dylan electrified folk. It's where Jay Leno hides out from paparazzi these days. In the summer, the streets swell with tourists, but come the winter, Newport becomes a barren wasteland, and me, being 21 years old and full of myself, thought I'd come back. There'd be some yacht waiting for me with a mate's position to sail down to the Caribbean. But the truth was, there were no jobs. There were no more opportunities. All the boats sailed south, 
I had no plan. So Casey, the captain of Anima, sent me down to Rose to go beg for work. How did Rose come to be? Well, in 1969, historian John Millar, only 24 years old at the time, commissioned acclaimed shipbuilding yard Smith & Rowland of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, to build a replica of the 1757 HMS Rose for the American Bicentennial Celebration. Rose was built for a mere $300,000. That's equivalent to $2.4 million today. Despite the skepticism, Millar pulls it off and delivers Rose in time for the celebration. Here we see her docked in Newport's downtown waterfront at the Bicentennial. And here we see her on a period postcard. But what happens after the event? There's no plan, and the ship falls into a terrible state of disrepair and decay, and almost a decade goes by until Connecticut businessman Kay Williams purchases Rose. Now, Williams is the owner of the family owned and operated Captain's Cove Seaport located in Black Rock Harbor, Connecticut. Williams purchases the ship, brings her down to Bridgeport, and he also hires Captain Richard Bailey highlighted in the circle here. And together they put together a crew and they rebuild the ship from the waterline up while she's floating in the water. The project was intense, but it became a community effort everyone pitched in and eventually williams goal was achieved when the united states coast guard certified rose as america's only class a sailing school vessel rose then goes on to serve as an educational platform offering various sail training opportunities to the public until she was acquired by 20th century fox so let's bring you back now to 2001 now that we got the background now, Rose was the antithesis of all my career ambitions. I wanted nothing to do with her, but I didn't have a choice. Casey told me to go down and ask for a man named Tony, and I had visions of a guy with a beard and tattoos and a raspy voice, someone who looks like that, right? Instead, I ended up meeting a young Tom Cruise lookalike, four inches taller, oddly cool and normal. And after talking for a few minutes, he invites me down to the ship where we walk down two flights of stairs and we come out on the gun deck. It's kind of like the living room of the ship. This is where the crew talks about their misery and how awful life is on board and they eat their meals. And well, we're talking, we're walking forward up to the bow and Tony's asked me questions and he opens up this tiny little hatch. We crawl down in this little compartment that I can't stand up in. And this is where it happens. This is where he offers me the job. For 25 cents an hour and all the salt water I can drink, I can sail to California to make a movie. Tom Rothman is one of the most accomplished men in Hollywood. At the time, he was the co-chairman of 20th Century Fox. Today, he's the chairman and CEO of Mo Mo Sony Motion Picture Group. Rothman's responsible for some pretty big movies, movies like Much Ado About Nothing, Titanic, Avatar, and guess what? He loves Patrick O'Brien books. So who's Patrick O'Brien? Well, for starters, He's an English author who pretended to be from Ireland. I don't know. He's best known for his 20 book Aubrey Matron series framed around the relationship of Captain Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron during the Napoleon era wars. Well, Rothman read all the books, bought the rights and spent nearly 10 years trying to figure out how he was gonna make a movie to do this. That's where acclaimed film director, Peter Weir comes in who last year won an honorary Oscar for his work on movies such as Witness, Dead Poet Society, and The Truman Show. Rothman pitched Weir the job three times until he finally accepted it. With their agreement in place, Weir sent off to go find the star character of his movie, and he went to the 2000 Tall Ship Festival in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, where he found Rose, the very ship that O'Brien said was much like the surprise that he wrote about in his books, as depicted in this painting by marine artist Jeff Hunt. With his ship secured, Weir got to work writing the script. Well, I think it's safe to say we all know I accept the job, otherwise there wouldn't be a book, right? Or a movie. I move onto the ship the first week in November, and to say the least, the living accommodations are atrocious. It's almost as bad as living in the monitor. Now, fortunately, I was able to convince my best friend Jared to take a job with me because I was too chicken to go it alone. A few days later, we motor rows over to Newport Shipyard so we can begin a massive refit on the ship. 
first item on the list is repowering the ship. And that meant getting these old engines up out of the engine room. In order to do that, we had to set up an I-beam on the gun deck and then set up chain lifts so we could chain lift those engines up and put them on dollies so they could be slid forward so a crane could hoist them up out through the cargo hatches. Days later, our new Caterpillar 3406 diesel engines arrive. They, in turn, are lowered into the ship, brought back down to the engine room, and mounted in place. Now, while this engine work is going on, I, as the ship's carpenter, am tasked with rebuilding our mass partners up at the foredeck. The mass partner is that structural element that prevents the mass from shredding the deck to pieces, okay? Days later, Rose is towed over to the railway so we can haul her out and begin a massive amount of underbody work. Soon, scaffolding is built around the ship, chainsaws, caulking irons, mallets, all these tools are broken out, all this noise is being made, dust, and our work list keeps growing and growing and growing. But fortunately, the officers have been aggressively recruiting our crew members, and we have more people on board, and we become this melting pot of personality, some for the good, some for the bad. And don't get me wrong, if my wife was here, she'd all tell you my personality is an acquired taste. But we were all there for a job, right? We had to learn how to put up with each other. We had to learn how to tolerate our differences because we were there for the same mission. Our job was to prepare our ship for our journey. But mind you, it wasn't always so bad on Rose. I mean, here we've got a picture of Captain Bailey washing his dog in the galley sink. And here we've got our Christmas tree lashed to the ship's wheel. But after two months of hard work, we can see the fruition of our labor coming to be. Rose is ready to be put back in the water. Her bottom is painted, her bow is coppered, and soon she floats. Now to reward us for all of our hard work, the officers throw a costume-themed farewell party with copious amounts of rum. And you know what happens when you put sailors and rum together. But despite having a great time, still lingering in the back of our mind is, when were we gonna get underway? There was no good weather window and Hollywood was putting the pressure on Captain Bailey. We departed from Newport on a cold, blustery January afternoon. I mean, just look at how cold that footage looks, right? There's Jared and myself saying farewell to Newport with the Newport Bridge behind us. Now, our crew was broken up into three watches. Each watch was led by an officer, followed by an able-bodied seaman and six deckhands. Those not standing watch were Captain Bailey and his dog, our engineer, our boss, and our cook, and the Hollywood representatives sent to safeguard their investment. Not wanting to miss a beat, the officers hopped into conducting safety drills so we could operate our ship safely through the evening. The next morning, hands are sent aloft so we can ready to set our square sails for the first time on our voyage. Fortunately, all that time in the yard had conditioned us how to work together as a crew. And within a few minutes, I understand all that's great about sailing a ship like Rose. So this being uh, relatively calm compared to earlier today, shortly after we sent all this canvas, it's actually the first time I've been able to kind of comfortably take the camera out on deck. What an incredible experience. I mean, being out there, all that pressure, I understand what's so great about being on a ship like Rose now. It makes sense to me. The next day, we cross the Gulf Stream. We shred our winter gear. We bask in the tranquil North Atlantic. We're through the worst of it. What are your thoughts on today? Excellent day. Beautiful day. Oh, how naive we all were. In 1805, Royal Navy officer Francis Beaufort created the Beaufort Scale. It's an empirical measure that relates wind speed to observed conditions at sea or on land. It ranges from forces 0 through 12, 12 being classified as hurricane conditions or 64 plus knots. This is a wind barb chart showing a universal representation of wind speed and direction. Notice I've highlighted the 75 knot barb this is a NOAA weather chart from January 13th, 2002. You'll see where I've highlighted that 75 knot barb, right where we are. This is what hurricane conditions look like on a ship like Rose. 
See that guy in red there? That's me after having just inspected our four peak because we were taking on so much water. The officers were afraid that we were gonna sink because our pumps went down, we went down. Now, I was 21. I was naive to the danger. I was having a great time, honestly. But I can't say that for everyone on board. In this shot, Rose does a 60 degree roll. Now, there's some sailors here. Right, you all know that sailing is this graceful, beautiful, quiet sport, right? Not on a ship like Rose, it's deafening. Inside of this ship was screaming as our ship was getting crushed and cracked by the pressures of the wind and the waves. In this shot, Scott is explaining why the lights are up behind him. We were taking on so much water that electrical fires started popping up inside the ship. At this point, the crew is forbidden from sleeping below decks. And we are being told to put sunscreen on and hydrate. That's quote unquote, we might sink soon. Now I'm back up on deck. The seas have built to 30 feet. The footage you're seeing is shot from 20 feet above our ship's waterline. Now, sailing a ship like Rose, it's absolutely miserable. I mean, it's not like yachting. There's no autopilot, there's no bimini, there's no you know, mimosa, champagne, brunch. You've got to be out there just get hit by the weather and the wind and the stinging pellets. And steering this ship was almost impossible. We had two helmsmen on the wheel, sometimes a third. Here we've got Captain Bailey wedged in the port quarter. Look at that horizon disappear behind him. But as the day goes on, we get used to it. We start telling jokes, we're laughing, having a great time. I love this shot because you can look at the pitching. Watch how fast that horizon is moving behind us. Alright, so Arnold wants to see what's up. It's picked up again. And four points start to blow out the starboard side. So Will and Pa on Tony have gone up to fix it. Alright, John just explained that one of our square sills has started to come unfurled. And unfortunately on a ship like Rose, that means the only way to fix it is to free climb the rig in this weather. And guess what? Tony picks me. There's 30 people on the ship. Why me? So that means free climbing 50 feet up and then 30 feet out to the end of the yard iron. And I'm going to tell you, this is one of the most terrifying things I've ever done. Because I get up there, we get up there, and that's when Tony tells me the plan. We are going to jump on the sail and punch it as hard as we can. Yeah. Seriously, that's the plan. Now, wow. unfortunately, John peels the bag off the camera while we do our little rodeo show, so you guys don't get to see us take control of that sail. But as you can see, we did pull that off. Here we are, we're tying sail gaskets around doing everything to make sure nobody has to go aloft in the storm again. Now, with the sail secure, Tony tells me to head back down to deck. And let me tell you, he didn't have to tell me twice. Ascending the rig, not that big of a deal. I mean, I'm staring at the mast, I'm looking up, I'm climbing up, okay, but descending the rig was absolutely terrifying. Because as I go to climb down, I'm looking down and I see the waves breaking over the ship. And every time Rose falls off a wave and hits a trough, it's like we hit a brick wall and the whole rig shakes and you hold on so you don't fall off. Now, I am exhausted by the time I get to deck. But, not Tony. I mean, this guy, he's like some kind of superhuman. Look, it's like he's walking through a park. I follow this man to hell any day. Now, we make it through this storm, but that's not the case for everyone. This is a shot of HMS Bounty, Rose's sister ship, sinking in Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Of her 15-member crew, one died and her captain was lost at sea. This photo was taken within 100 miles of the footage I just showed you. Well, it's hard to believe that that flag was new five days earlier, let alone that we were in such a dire situation 24 hours prior. The interior of our ship is destroyed. It looks worse than my daughter's bedroom on a Saturday morning. And all of our toilet paper has gotten soaked. Now, after a few hours of some sail repairs, we set all our square sails again and continue to charge south to Puerto Rico. Now, before the storm, this would have seemed like a good amount of wind to me, but now, after all that we've been through, oh, 
It's just enough to fill the sails. A few days later, we sight land. Puerto Rico, land ho. Hands are sent aloft as we furl our square sails and ready to dock our ship. Now, after having nearly looked death in the eyes in the North Atlantic in January, I'm chomping at the bits for some fun. I want to go dancing. I want to experience the culture. I want to have some drinks. And then reality hits when I find out where we're going to dock Rose. It's some half-abandoned ferry terminal that looks like the film set from Mad Max. Then, adding insult to injury, the officers tell us about a massive work list that we need to accomplish in two days' time. See, during the storm, we suffered a catastrophic structural failure when our upright bit here failed. That caused our bowsprit to push into the ship and slack the rig and compromise its integrity. We needed to slack the rigging, push that bowsprit out, temporarily, temporarily shore that bit, reset the bowsprit, and then retune the rig in two days' time. Those not working on the bowsprit repair were sent along to rig up the Tagallons, our highest square sails, for the next leg. We were given a half day off. Not wanting to miss a beat, we all pitched in and got a minivan and we went looking for a beach. And guess what? After sailing to Puerto Rico, we got lost trying to find the beach. Here we are asking a local for directions. Of course we sent the woman. Guys, we're just terrible, aren't we? But eventually we find the famed Rincon and we enjoy a few hours reprieve from the oppressive conditions on the tall ship Rose. We are now a conditioned crew. When we departed from Newport, I had no idea what did what. I didn't know what line did this or that or how we controlled our sails. But now I get it, I understand. We are kind of like a smooth working machine. And that means I can sit back and relax. And as any good sailor in this room knows, that's when horrible things happen, right? So it's like an hour before sunset. I'm waiting in line for my chicken enchilada dinner and I hear a giant explosion. And there's a call for all hands on deck. And I come running up and I see the last thing any sailor ever wants to see. We had been dismasted in the middle of the Caribbean Sea under full sail. So, what happened? Let's see, let's see. Is it gonna work? I don't think it's gonna work. Anyways, our highest mast up at the top there exploded, our main tagallon, causing the sail to fall over our main topsail. And that caused our top sail, the foremast, could explode as well. What happened also was the Thomas, the middle mast on the main mast, was damaged at the top and at the bottom. Now you would think that broken mast, you want to strike your sail, you want to reduce the loads, but because of the damage to our top, main top mast, we were worried that if we struck the sail, the entire rig was going to go over the side of the boat. Now I'm up on deck for two seconds, and guess what? Tony taps me again. There's 30 people. Why am I the one who has to go to the top? <sighs> there I am at the top of our tallest broken mast now, wondering which side I'm going to jump to when the rig goes over. We've got Andy, our second mate, right there, and then Christina, our third mate, also. This is a shot from the deck looking up. You see Tony up on our foremast with our ship's bosun as they try to figure out how to deal with that rat nest. Captain Bailey takes the wheel. It's the only time he steered the ship in our entire journey. Here, we've got the rest of the crew standing on deck, ready for us to shout down orders. This is a shot from my perspective, looking down. You can see the broken mast hanging over by Andy's shoulder. And this is a shot of Tony cutting away the 40-gallon sail. Now, our officers were outstanding leaders. This is terrifying, but they kept everyone calm, cool, and collected, and occasionally offered a joke every now and then. And eventually, luck, everyone got a chance to climb aloft and pitch in as we worked hard to stabilize our rigs so we could get through the night to figure out what to do the next morning. Next day, we lower our broken rig down to deck. We are exhausted, but we carry on. Three days later, we arrive in Colon, Panama, the Atlantic port entrance city to the Panama Canal. Fortunately, the owner of our boat has a really big wallet, and that meant that we could hire a massive crane to help continue with the downrigging of the broken elements of our, of our rig. Now, working in Panama, one of the worst experiences of my life. The heat index was 125 degrees, and the sun was just cooking our skin. Not to mention, we hardly had any time off. 
there was a lot of infighting growing on the crew, with the crew. A lot of people were mumbling. We were getting angry. I mean, they kept grinding us and working us. I mean, here we've got a shot of the crew, and I'll tell you what, if that's a fake smile, right? Right there. I mean, that's that's the fakest smile I've ever seen. Since departing from Newport, we'd only been given a half day off in Puerto Rico. In Panama, we were given three hours off. But I'll tell you what, after that first hour, I was ready to leave. Well, the Panama Canal, for those that don't know, is an artificial waterway that connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. It's 51 miles long and located at the Isthmus of Panama. Fortunately for us, we were given an evening slot to go through the canal, a welcome reprieve from the oppressive heat. Now, going through the canal means transiting three ascending locks that raise you up to the center lake level. You then transit the lake, and then on the other end, you go through three descending locks that bring you down to Pacific Sea height. The entire process took us just over seven hours. Once we'd reached the Pacific, we motor out to the Panamanian island of Taboga. The next morning, I wake up in absolute paradise. It's beautiful. And the officers tell us that we've all earned a half day off. Lucky us, right? Fortunately, I have to stand the first watch, which means I'll be free afterwards. Once I get a chance, I hop in a dinghy and I head to shore. Now, some of my shipmates hung out on the beach. Some people, you know, peruse town. I decided to hike to the top of the island to check out the views. But eventually, we all rendezvoused at a local hotel with very cheap pina coladas and a pool. The next day, we depart for Mexico. And Captain Bailey puts two of our crew members in a dinghy so we can take this incredible footage of our dismasted frigate under sail. I am certain this is the only genuine footage in the world of a dismasted frigate under sail. Well, there's that saying, you know, where the Atlantic brought destruction, the Pacific brought boredom. And idle hands are the devil's workshop. So the officers, they continued to pound and they put us to work coming up with every trick they could think of. They even had us sanding and scraping the broken spars that were never gonna get used again. The morale continues to sink. People get angry. We are festering and fuming. You know, it's just awful. Look at this picture. Look how miserable everybody looks on this ship. But it's not just us the officers have to contend with. There's also other phenomena like the famed Tawanapec winds, which are micro like hurricane bursts of wind that comes down through Shivas Pass. And then there's the threat of actual pirates. Here we've got the Mexican Navy offering assistance in an old World War II vessel. We seriously considered arming ourselves with our cannons using nails and screws and a couple cans of black powder. But eventually we arrive in Mexico. Not much has broken on rows on this passage or this leg, but the morale is crushed. The officers know they've got to cut us some slack. So they tell us we're going to get a full 24 hours off. Hooray! Not wanting to miss a beat, we hop to having the best time we can in Acapulco, starting off with mechanical bull riding. We then go see the famed Acapulco cliff divers. My personal favorite was bombing around downtown Acapulco in this Volkswagen Beetle taxi. Our youngest crew member, only 16, tried bungee jumping for the first time. His mom just saw the footage this summer for the first time. She was not happy at all. But I'll tell you what, this is where it all came together for us. All that infighting where we didn't get along, the mismatching, we kind of put it all to the side. You know, some would say maybe it's because of what we accomplished by this point. I think it was the tequila and the dancing. Our journey continues on for 2,000 more miles, and you think Mother Nature would stop lobbing curveballs at us, right? This water spout, or how about this photo? There's actually one, two, three water spouts. And Rose continues to break down and fail. She is crumbling beneath our feet, and we are doing everything we can to get her to hold together so we can make it to San Diego. But we see dolphins. We even make time to read books now. I build a fake fish for Captain Bailey to play a prank on him, and it works. But eventually we arrive in San Diego on a cold, gray, blustery day, much like the day we departed Newport. And the sentiment on board is mixed. Half the crew is glad for accomplishing our mission, but the other half is sad because the chemistry that we formed will forever dissipate and never exist again. 
Rose is too broken to sail anymore. Collaboration is the process of two or more people working together to complete a task or achieve a goal. How did our officers pull it off? How did they take a molly bunch of misfits to come together and work like a team? I mean, we sailed through some fierce weather. We survived a dismasting without anyone being killed or horribly injured. We slept while others stood watch. And we learned through the process of doing. When this started, we were all just colleagues, but we became so much more. We became a family. And when I think about it, I come up with four key words that describe the success of our officers. First being leadership. The next being mentorship, followed by stewardship. And then most importantly, friendship. Well, Rose really was too broken to sail. So broken that the insurance companies mandated that we haul her out at the naval dockyards in San Diego to complete a long list of structural repairs. While there, we began her aesthetic transformation to HMS Surprise. Once we got the green light from the insurance companies, we put her back in the water and brought her down to Ensenada, Mexico, where her transformation was completed so she could star in the movie Master and Commander. When we board, you'll take him out of the ship. Take him out of the ship. Thank you, sir. For home and for the prize! Stay off to us. Now, I am standing here before you because when I was in high school, I had an opportunity to read some incredible books by some contemporary authors. I got to read uh, uh, The Perfect Storm by Sebastian Younger, uh, Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. And reading those stories made me feel more confident about, confident about taking a path less traveled, about going to become an apprentice to build one in boats instead of doing what I was told and going to college without really a focus or goal. Um, and I think it's really important that we continue to tell stories of our adventures so we can inspire future generations to feel good about getting out there, skinning their knees, being uncomfortable, seeing the world, trying different things. So I'd love to ask, I mean, if you don't want to buy a copy of my book for yourself, maybe you could buy one for a niece or a nephew or send a copy to the school that you went to. Um, that is my presentation. I want to thank you all for having me. And can I take any questions? Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us here at the Mariners Museum and Park, and we appreciate your continued support. Thank you.